Multi Hazards, all about protecting communities. Hi everyone, this is Multi Hazards, a podcast where we take a deep dive into issues of emergency management, climate change adaptation, security, etc. Ultimately, it's about protection, protecting communities. I'm your host, Vin Nelson. Today, I'm excited to interview Dr. Gio Roberti, Section Head of Natural Hazards at Minerva Intelligence in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, where we're podcasting from. Now, Dr. Gio Roberti is a geohazard geologist. His research has focused on the effects of climate change, on volcanic slope stability, and has led multiple international projects between Canada, Peru, France, and Italy. The results of his research have been published in scientific journals, presented at major geological conferences, and reached the broader public through various media reports. Dr. Gio Roberti is now leading Minerva Intelligence's Natural Hazard Section, working on merging human knowledge with machine intelligence to enhance Natural Disaster Management with Cognitive AI. Now, just as a little insert here, I would like to say a territorial acknowledgement about the land from which I'm podcasting just outside, as I told you, Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. And I'm borrowing the text from our local college, Kwantlen Polytechnic University, or KPU. So here we go. We work, study, and live in a region south of the Fraser River, which overlaps with the unceded traditional and ancestral lands of the Kwantlen, Musqueam, Katsi, Semiamu, Sawasan, Kikite, and Kwikwetlam peoples. Now, these are the First Nations here around this area in the suburbs of Vancouver, BC, Canada. Now, without further ado, let's get to the interview. So it's a pleasure to have you here today, and uh, thanks for coming in. Let's just uh, get started here. So you're from Italy, I guess, right? Yes. Uh, Thanks for the invitation, and yes. Basically, you were spending most of your life in Italy. Yeah, so um, I start studying abroad and traveling when I was uh, in the early 20s. So yes, up to now, most of my life has still been in Italy and I grew up there and did part of the first part of my study there. And for sure, my culture and my accent tells tells a lot about that. Okay, great, great. Yeah, so I just wondering if, uh, if you'd be able to tell us more about your educational and your work journey. Um, yeah, so I... I I enrolled in the geology program in uh, at the University of Turin, and um, that's in I Italy, guess, of course. Yeah, that's in it. Tur- Tur- would be Torino, and is the city where there were the Winter Olympics before. Oh Mar- yeah, actually, that's right. And um, yeah, so I was interested in science, and uh, but also in nature, and I wanted to do a job that allowed me to be outside, not in the office all the time. And so that's why I went for geology because uh, is uh, is a science and a profession where you really need to go outside, look at rocks, look at the morphology of the landscape to collect data and to make your uh, your observations. So so then you can deliver your uh, assessment. Okay, great, great. And you you decided to go like bachelor, master's, PhD, the whole the whole shebang. Yeah, I mean in Europe things are different. Like uh, um, undergrad and master are are almost uh, a given. Like masters are course based, and um, and uh, as the work uh, say work market is not as flexible as open as here. Okay. Most of the time, most of people do undergrad and masters straight away, and right. then uh, oftentimes for maybe the most uh, the best I mean best people at school is almost natural to 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 go uh, 
forward in the academic path and enroll in a PhD. Um, okay, sure. And so that's how it's, it's, it's culturally very different from Europe and North America. They all grad school and PhD uh, thing. So it was, was almost a natural uh, path for me, I would say. Right. And your master's degree, was it, it was done like partially here in uh, Canada or was it with like a joint venture with the, with France or? No. So, uh, the master program was in Italy, but I came over a year thanks to a summer school. And so I okay. spent five months at SFU. And so then in that trip, I met, uh, this professor called Ben Van Vick de Vries which is uh, we which is British but works in France. Okay. So then when I was back in Italy, uh, I I kept in touch with Ben and Ben and Brent from SFU were starting this joint PhD program between France and Canada, and they offered me the the, the position. So okay, then I great. came back, and and the PhD program was a uh, was a joint. Um, PhD between France and Canada. Wonderful. And just for our international listeners, SFU is uh, it's kind of local Vancouver language. It's for um, probably our second most famous university, first uh, Simon Fraser University, SFU. So it's a quite famous place, I think, right? Uh, internationally. Yeah, and is a center of excellence in terms of uh, natural hazards, and um, so so that's why there was a summer school in the first place. And then that's why I came here for the PhD in the second place. Okay, that's great. Well, I have a confession to make. I was just thinking about it today. Actually, I, I went to SFU a long time ago, the late 80s, and I took intro to geology three times. And I <laughs> failed it twice. <laughs> Can uh, you believe it? I think uh, the first time is because my I was working in Yukon. My father enrolled me, and I'm like, what the heck? I asked for geography. He gave me geology. What am I studying these rocks for? And then <laughs> and then I failed, and then took it again. I failed again. Finally, the third time, I had the same professor who said, finally, pass it. But I didn't realize at the time, like, the value of geology. It wasn't just studying rocks. I mean, anyways, what we'll be talking about is is how fascinating this this gets when you put it into the real world, right? So, so that leads me to my second question. What drew you to this line of work? Um, yeah, I, I think I, I partially covered it a bit, maybe as I, 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 I always been interested in nature and science. And instead of uh, going for more uh, theoretical science or more lab based sciences, I went for a science for which you need to be outside, which is geology. You need to go and collect rocks and look at rocks and um, and also the morphology of the landscape. So you need to be outside and be able to read the landscape. Okay. So but you could have went, went for forestry or, or something else, right? So, But you chose geology. Uh, yeah, I guess. I, I mean, forestry is not as big as here in Italy. So it's a less of a of a clear um, context. Right, and like okay. in Italy, there's not the profession of, uh, I mean, partially there is, but it's not as uh, strong as here. And so then I prefer to go for a path where there was a clear profession, which was the one of the geologists. And maybe I, I, I was also partially inspired by my uncle, which is a geologist. And when oh, I was growing up- well, There you go, family uncle, connection. <laughs> yeah, I was traveling around the world and uh, going, and bringing back rocks and stuff like that. So and, it was kind of. Did you have any idea that this would lead to like uh, a study on volcanoes and landslides and 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 uh, basically maybe you have some connection in the mining industry and and transportation, keeping the roads safe. Yeah. yeah. No, I guess the the geohazard component of my life came uh, a bit later. Okay. So I was I really like the the hazard courses at the university, but then I started to specialize into geohazard during my master and then in the PhD. So I I really like to uh, be able to help people with the thing I'm doing, and so I I was uh, I guess attracted by the idea of uh, 
study geohazard because there's a direct implication for everybody's uh, life. Like if I I can you know imp improve geohazard management and maybe save lives too. Right. Well, personally, my interest is I am uh, looking at uh, disaster risk reduction. They call it DRR. And uh, um, some of the professors that are on your the uh, Center for Natural Hazards in Simon Fraser University, you're connected with that, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. OK, yeah, I know a couple of these professors on the website. One is uh, Dr. John Clegg. I yeah. saw him at a conference. He was talking about the flooding that happened in um, Grand Forks, British Columbia. And then there's Dr. Lori Daniels with uh, UBC uh, Forestry. Mm -hmm. So you're uh, you you are with a lot of great people. Yeah. So it's uh, at you. Well, you're one of them now already. So uh, that's great. But uh, I think you after you you finished your your PhD at Simon Fraser. Um, that was recently, right? Yeah, I finished the program in 2018 and in the fall. Yeah. Okay. And oh, so let's just back up a, a moment there. I I know you have a connection with uh, Mount Meager. That's a volcano that's uh, just a little ways what from Squamish and Whistler, which are the famous ski mountains north of Vancouver, where the Olympics near where the Olympics were held in 2010. That mountain, uh, Mount Meager, right? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. So I. My PhD focuses on Mount Meager, so I study the stability of the volcano um, I, with a multidisciplinary approach. So I put together volcanology, geomorphology, quaternary geology, remote okay. sensing, and so on to, to, to come up with a somewhat comprehensive understanding of, uh, of Mount Meager and okay. why it's different from the other mountains and the other volcanoes. And I, I think you have a few YouTube videos on there about it. Yeah, uh, so during, during uh, the PhD, st students are invited to work on divulgation and dissemination of their work. Okay. And uh, so there are this uh, program like uh, your thesis in three minutes. And so that's one thing I did at SFU. And then when I was in France, actually, I made the first video because I was applying for um, uh, a grant awarded by one of those mountain clothing companies. Oh, okay. This adventure thing, but I didn't get it. I, I was too scientific, probably. They, they look okay. Cool. But the video was, uh, uh, I think, was fun to make it, and I hope some people enjoy uh, okay. seeing it. Okay, well, I did. And you made, I think you made another one. There was like a kind of a, uh, I won't say cartoon, but it was like a graphic showing the uh, side of the mountain falling down. Oh, that's a numerical simulation. So uh, geologists can, um, there's there's technique to, to simulate a, they run out of a landslide, so you have a 3D surface or a 3D model of uh, the mountain, and then you you can simulate a landslide and see how far that landslide would go. Okay. That, so this that, is after the fact, or this is uh, like before the fact? Yeah. So people do it before and after the facts. Sometimes okay. they do it after to understand better the phenomenon, and then actually they use. Uh, the parameter that they learn trying to simulate a past event to then simulate eventual failure that might occur in the future. So, right. so you, you model the past to learn about the future somewhat. Okay. And of course, I don't think that was 2010. They had a big landslide there. Uh, yeah. So I don't think you were around that time, but you, you studied the landscape later on. Yeah. So I, the lesson was 2010. I came here the first time in 2012, and I wrote okay. some paper about that landslide. And um, so the model, the cartoon you saw, was actually the model of the 2010 landslide. All right. And, and then uh, now there are other slopes that might fail, like the one that did in 2010. And the problem is that these slopes are even bigger. And right. there is infrastructure near the volcano, 
And also, even if these big landslides might not directly reach Pemberton, the little mm-hmm. town. The closest nearby, town is Pemberton, right? Yeah. The problem with these big landslides is that they can dam rivers so oh, that yeah. a lake can form behind the landslide dam. And then when the, the dam breaches because there's too much water or the water reach the dam level, then okay. generates a flood and this might affect population. So for the 2010 landslide, they actually evacuated the town because there was a landslide dam that, mm-hmm. and a lake formed. But then the landslide was during the summer. So there was a river where uh, at a low level. And so then the uh, the flood wave that came from the dam bridge didn't overtop or overflow the, the river. Um, from the river, right? Okay. So that that was a lucky combination. Right, right. I think I saw there's a couple YouTube videos of, I don't know, with some hunters or maybe some government workers that are that, that took some video of it. So it looks like it was pretty scary, but nobody got hurt. Yeah, that was very lucky that nobody got hurt. because. Right. Uh, and, and then, so later on, you brought a whole team, and I, I saw a CBC... Uh, just to let the international listeners, uh, CBC is Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. So it's a radio station, a TV station. They also have news websites. So I saw you on a news article on CBC, I think, with a, a whole team. And you were just like at the, the mouth of that volcano kind of looking in. Yeah. So for um, one of the, the, the interesting fact of Mount Meager is that it's covered by glaciers, right? Okay. And now these glaciers are melting. And so things that before were covered by ice and we didn't know about now are coming up at the surface because the ice is thin. And right. so these fumaroles, we call these gases coming out of the volcanoes, um, made big ice caves on one of these glaciers on Mount Meager. And so uh, now there's a there's a big team studying the 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 whole mountain, and uh, yeah, we we went there to look at the interaction between uh, this glacier melting, the heat of the volcano, and the big landslides. Wow. Because it's pretty, isn't it? Pretty dangerous up there. Like if you uh, smell some of those fumes. Yeah. So there are different kind of gases. Uh, so many of them can actually kill you and the one you can smell are not too bad because you can smell oh, okay. them okay so once you so can't you, smell they get you the, the bad one is is co2 uh oh. because you can't smell it and it's heavier than air so it sits in depression and um and so if you buy or crevasses so if you if you go in one of these depression you don't smell anything you just fall asleep and you die so, so you have to be very careful you need to be very careful about volcanic gases yes and okay. then another hazard that is there is uh, landslide and of different size from rockfall to big landslide because uh, volcanic rocks that have been in contact with ice are usually weak and so they tend to fall more easily than other kind of rocks and so there are, you know there was a big 2010 landslides there will be other big landslides in the future a landslide in 1975 actually killed four people at Mount Meager. Oh. So it's, it's a place very active and dynamic. So you, when you are there, you need to remember that there are hazards and you are right. exposed to them. It's not that far from Vancouver. No, it's not. It's, it's, it's maybe a couple hundred kilometers. Wow. So and so, what's the climate change connection to, to all this? So... Uh, Environment is a, is a dynamic system where everything is connected. And so every change in any of environmental parameters will lead to other changes, right? So okay. now climate is changing, temperature are rising, precipitation uh, patterns are changes, like changing, like there are more, more intense storm and uh, then longer period of drought. Mm-hmm. So all of this also affects the abilities of the mountains because they they are uh, exposed to events that were not uh, there before. So okay. if we like talk big in, storms, like big storm, and it's just the changing condition, right? So mm-hmm. for Meager, is about the glacier melting. So right. 
there was a state or, or if you you can imagine some sort of uh, meta stable balance where uh, these glacier were in um, were uh, were maybe retreating or advancing of small amount but now they are pulling back very fast and okay. so the the mountain becomes meta stable it's not needs to adjust to this new state where glaciers are not there anymore and so you have uh, in response there are more landslides so okay. uh, you can wow. imagine glacier somewhat as a supporting uh, layer like if you have a glacier on the base of a slope you have ice p- keeping the slope up to some so extent. it's kind of like a a supporting blanket or something just it's there and then when you take away the blanket it the land changes the the sides of the volcano changes and is that right yeah something like that you can imagine it something okay. like that Wow. So I, I never had thought that that volcanoes had something to do with with climate change, like volcanoes or earthquakes or or yeah. anything. But I, I guess it it affects almost everything. Yeah. So, I mean, there's there's a double like the interaction between climate and volcanoes is uh, is very complex. So there's on one side. Now we are talking about Mount Meager. And we see that the glacier are melting because of climate change. And so we have landslide because of that. But then you can also have an effect of, cli- of volcanoes on climate. So very big eruption from volcanoes can put enough ash in the atmosphere that they cool the global temperature. And oh, these are, right. there's been few cases, in, documented cases in history. And so you have this double, uh, double effect. So now, sure. but now, yeah. Mm-hmm. I was just going to say I wasn't it in the last decade did wasn't there a volcano that erupted and then basically it it covered uh, many many places all around the world like the ash cloud and planes couldn't take off from airports. Yeah, that's that was a that was a volcano in Iceland and so oh, the yeah. ashes uh were uh, like disrupted flights across Europe. Uh, but that wasn't that big of an eruption. So, you know, okay. Europe was affected, but I don't think global temperature was really affected at all. Like what I'm talking about are the big uh, Krakatoa eruption in the 1800s and so. Okay. Uh, that there were a few years where summer, there was basically no summer and crops died in England because right, of right. an eruption in Indonesia. And that brought that in England. And, you know, from something that happened very far away. But, okay. Yeah. I saw a map uh, before. Basically, there are a lot of these volcanoes just uh, dotting the whole west coast of uh, British Columbia and Washington State. Is, isn't that uh, true? Yeah, it's correct. So, you, you know, from, uh, from Alaska to Canada and then the States and then Mexi- Mexico and then you go down to South America and there's... It goes all the way down. Wow. All the way down. And this is because the um, plate tectonics, right? So you have the, um, the oceanic plate of the Pacific Ocean that is sub- uh, going under North okay. and South American plates. So it goes along the, the whole West Coast from Alaska down to yeah. South America. Okay. Well, actually, it goes around all the Pacific Ocean. We call that the Pacific Ring of Fire because the, oh, yeah, right. you have the subduction all around and you have volcanoes along the subduction plate. So you so, have. Okay. Wow. Do you think the people of Vancouver and, say, Seattle and maybe Portland, Oregon, do you think we need to worry? Uh, I mean, we need to be aware of it. Uh, like, there's there's lots of studies f- for um, done by the USGS about hazard from the volcanoes, and especially for Seattle, uh, there's uh, Mount Rainier. Okay, right, very famous. It, yeah, very famous, and uh, is known for doing very big landslides. They travel very far. Mm-hmm. And so they have monitoring system and so on for in case of big landslide coming from that mountain. Because another problem with volcanoes is that they are built quickly in geological term compared to normal mountain. So you can imagine them like a pile of sands that is put up by a kid or something. Okay, at the and, beach. <laughs> at the beach, yeah. And then as they are, this pile of sand is built quickly, it's very unstable. And so what they do... Um, 
they fail generating very big lands. Like you, you can imagine, you know, a big cone of the volcano and half of it collapses and forms a very big landslide. Um, these are rare events that happen every few thousand of years. Okay. Mm -hmm. Years. But then when they happen, these landslides are huge and they can travel very far. And so even if you think you are far enough, you maybe are not. So it's something to keep in mind. So, like, oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry for interrupting there. I, I just, uh, today is, uh, 21st of May mm -hmm. and, and the 18th of May, uh, 1980 was the eruption of Mount St. Helens. Okay. I remember it, believe it or not. <laughs> so this is the 40th anniversary of that event. And during that eruption, a very big landslide occurred and that was uh, cubic kilometers in size. So the, wow. that was the first time that humans, uh, or humans with technical, te with technology, uh, witness such a big landslide. And that kind of changed the way in which we look at volcanoes, because now we know that half of the mountain can collapse. And that was something that we didn't really observe before 1980s. And so that, that has been a big step forward for volcanology as a science. Okay. And so uh, I'm just wondering what kind of, say, industries or communities or uh, are affected most by uh, these landslides? So I, at first, the first thing I can think of, say, highways and roads, but what else is affected? Well, highways, road, pipelines, pipelines are everywhere. Uh, you can, uh, and people, like there's towns. You, if you think about Vesuvius in Italy, is right. is the one of the most famous volcanoes ever because when it erupted during uh, the Roman time, it destroyed Pompeii, the city. Okay. And, so, mm -hmm. and now there's you know there's uh, millions of people in the same area, so it's it's a problem. Right, right, and then also the uh, especially in British Columbia, Washington State, and uh, Oregon, California, people are moving to all these kind of countryside mountainside area so there are more people at risk maybe they're yeah. spread out more but yeah i mean north america and canada are kind of lucky because the density of population is low so there's not that many people near these volcanoes even if you know seattle is kind of close to more mm -hmm. near but there are places in you know starting from italy and then if you go to south america to southeast asia where there's millions of people living on these volcanoes and so when things happen there, you really have, you might have tens of thousands of people dying. And that happened in the, in the eighties in Colombia, for example, where right. an eruption under a glacier caused a, a big volcanic debris flow, which is a, a mix of uh, rock and water, some sort of, okay. uh, you can imagine like a flood of rocks or something. Mm -hmm. Like a yeah. kind of toxic soup. Yeah. Is everything that, in that it. one was more <laughs> just about uh, the volume that, than the, there wasn't much toxicity, but anyway, oh, okay. the fact is that it covered a town and 20,000 people died, right? Wow. So That's this tragic. kind of stuff happened every now and again, and they shouldn't. Okay. So how do you bring all of this uh, knowledge and um, all these uh, new skills that you have from all your education, how do you bring it into your new job? So uh, my new job, I work for a... a tech startup that does uh, artificial intelligence application in geology. Okay. And um, I, what we do is really trying to build expert system. So to put human knowledge into the computer to make prediction. So today there's a lot of hype around machine learning, mm -hmm. but machine learning, you need a lot of data to train an algorithm to make prediction. So then if you don't have data, or um, the data, the quality of your data is not good enough, the predictions are not that good. So in geology, it's very hard to get data because uh, you need to go to the field and collect data. And most of uh, the assessment geology do are usually done by wordy description of rocks. So you need to ingest these words that change by uh, geologist to geologist. Mm -hmm. And so machine learning systems don't work very well in geology. 
Um, so then what we do is to really structure uh, the human knowledge um, by defining the rules that links different concepts so that the, the, the computer can reason with it. So say, you know, granite is a kind of igneous rock, for example. Okay. So I, I tell the computer the granite is a rock and is igneous. So then maybe the computer finds an, an igneous rock and it tells me, oh, you know, it's an igneous rock. Maybe you can check if it's also a granite. So it's a, really a way to, to, to work in a space where there are not that many data set and uh, but still leverage all this human knowledge we have collected about natural phenomena and still produce uh, uh, prediction, make prediction. And the advantage of this method is also that our prediction are explainable, are very easy to understand because everything is logically consistent. While with machine learning or other technique, they are kind of opaque because it's hard to keep track of what the software is doing. Okay, I find that fascinating. I was I was watching, I was I was listening to and watching your recent webinar on on the machine learning for landslides and natural hazards, and I kept thinking that you know, for, I mean, it's not like you're teaching a machine to think, but you yourselves. Behind the scenes, you have to make all these connections uh, between di different items in the data, and then it has to work so that in the end result, people can can use that and for everyday life or whatever they're doing. Say it's mining companies or highways department, right? Yeah. So what we do, we the software really mimics the way in which human humans think. So if you want to buy a house you start to think about your dream house, right? Mm -hmm. We'll have a, we'll be someplace, maybe in Vancouver. We'll be, we'll have a garden maybe and a certain number of rooms. And then when you go through the house listing, you do a comparison between your dream house and the real house in the listing. So we do the same thing for landslide and mineral deposits. So we define conceptual models of landslides that are based on science and um, and uh, scientific papers and knowledge that has been collected uh, by geologists. And then we go through the map and we see which zones are more similar to this conceptual model so that we know that, you know, we know where the problems are or where the mineral deposit might be. Right. I was just thinking because, for example, I'm interested in the field of emergency management. I was just thinking uh, it would be really helpful to know which mountainsides might give way in the next 10 years or which areas might have a problem. Yes, that's correct. And uh, I've been working on developing um, apps in this specific domain so that um, just by clicking on the maps, you can click on the slope and see what's going on on that slope. And you can, there's a rating, and so you see how bad is that slope. We are also working, and this would be the hazard part, which are the bad slopes. And then on top of that, we can also intersect with the uh, human's infrastructure and say, okay, this slope is bad, but it's in the middle of nowhere. And maybe there's a slope that is a little less bad, but it's near a house. So that's where you need to go and focus your energy. And this right, is so, the, the risk component of... Uh, so this city. would be useful for, say, city planners and, and, and pe people trying to develop the land and know, know how to use it yeah, and see yeah, if absolutely. it's risky or not. Yeah, absolutely. Because uh, there's, there's a lack of knowledge transfer um, from geologists and then decision maker or land planner because geological assessments are usually um, written in uh, technical reports and deliver as static maps. So then when the, the, the policy maker needs to understand what's going on, doesn't have the time or nor the geological knowledge to really understand what's going on. So by providing dynamic and explainable uh, maps, where you just click and you get an explanation of why uh, a certain zone might be dangerous, we think we can really bridge this gap between scientists and decision makers. 
and so we are we are I mean we are working in that domain yeah that's that's brilliant actually there's so many applications that this can be used used for I believe in the future yeah so is this actually your your first time uh, the last couple of years uh, getting into artificial intelligence or has it has it have, do you have a background in that uh, no, I would say my background is in uh, geology, but then just, yeah, since I joined Minerva, uh, the startup I'm working for now, I've been uh, really working on merging human knowledge and machine intelligence. And by, I've been working with um, one of the co-founder of the, of the company is a computer science professor from UBC. Okay. And so I've been mm-hmm. working with some of his students and we have written papers and produced lots of uh, uh, new new knowledge in the domain of um, artificial intelligence yeah. really that is that is so fascinating so let me just switch gears uh, again and go back to climate change like right now based on all the years of uh, experience you have what's your feeling about where climate change is headed right now uh, I mean we cannot stop it like there's a worst case scenario best case scenarios and everything in between so there will be changes and will be dramatic Uh, most most places will be underwater some other will be too hot to be lived in other places will be hit by very strong storm and we see this happening now right it's not uh, a secret so there will be changes in multiple level and and it's i think it's a big challenge for 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 humanity right to we mm-hmm. will need to adapt to this climate change. We cannot avoid it anymore. So we just, I mean, we can try to minimize the damage, right? But we cannot fully avoid it anymore. Um, so we need to to be to be prepared to change and to adapt. And there's no, yeah. So That's adaptation it. is going to be a huge field. There be it's going to be. Uh, it'll have artificial intelligence. It'll have engineers, city planners. It'll be health, health experts. It's it's it's, it's got to be diverse because climate change is just it's like huge. Yeah. So I mean, it's a global problem, and people have keep tackling it from just a local perspective. You know, they talk about maybe cutting carbon emission, but they don't. Uh, they or, or sea level rise, and they often lack of a holistic view or a comprehensive view on the problem. And now everything will be affected because the climatic zone will shift uh, bio, the, 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 the eco- ecosystem will, uh, will change. Animals will move from a place to another. Plants will grow in some places and not in other places. So it's very much a global, global challenge we need to face. And we are divided in so many nations with so many different law and everyone has his law and everybody has his own priority for his own country. And so that's a big challenge. But I guess just we we just uh, we are just coming out this uh, COVID uh, crisis. Right. And right. we see, we see uh, an interesting phenomenon where all the countries in the world have adapted similar similar strategies. Right. So. This thing somewhat, the virus somewhat gives hope to me, I think, because it shows that if we really want, we might mm-hmm. be able to act all together and, and take effective action. But the problem is that uh, climate change is such an abstract uh, concept that people don't understand it. And so they can't, they can't act on it. Like a virus is easier to understand. And so they were able to, to do something about it. Mm-hmm. Climate change is something more difficult to to grasp, right? And it seems slow, more. It, it's not as urgent. It's more like slow moving. Yeah, it's a, they, they call about this this the slow hitting climate crisis. I can't remember how they. they it's like slow mo. <laughs> slow mo. Yeah, yeah. It's, you 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 are perfectly right. Like people already in the seventies were warning governments and such that. Um, the, the system is uh, was unsustainable, right? But nothing happened for in the 70s. Nothing, nothing happened in the 80s, nor the 90s. And eventually, now disasters are starting to happen, and people are realizing that the climate change was a real thing already in the 70s. And uh, but yeah, it's like you know, uh, 
40, 50 years and so many government have changed and there's there was uh, the lack of a constant uh, climate policy in any government. And so then that's what happened. Like if you put, uh, say, economic growth before anything else, then, you know, other part will pay for it. And in our case, it's been the climate. Right, exactly. And scientists like you who love to go out and do field work, you're seeing it you seeing it up close and it must be a little bit scary. Yeah, I mean, is yeah, it's, I was actually plotting some uh, the temperature for BC in the past century the other weekend for fun. I'm, okay. <laughs> you no, know, nerdy scientist and it's crazy like the the the, the spike in the last uh, in the last couple of decades is is just crazy. Right. Uh, yeah, I did some. There's a for Canadian government. I think it's called Historical Archives. I I went to Pitt Meadows. This this the closest weather station near me across the Fraser River. So I looked at August and what is the average temperature all throughout the 80s. And then I compared it to the 2010s. And basically the 80s, it was like averaging something like 17 degrees. And then and in the last 10 years, it was like uh, two degrees warmer, 19. And I don't think I slept that night. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. sometimes uh, you have to, uh, I don't know, take a step back when you're studying all these things. It can give you a few sleepless nights. So so let's uh, just um, go to um, maybe a more personal question here. Like, what would you say is your theme, your life ideal? Life ideal? Uh, yeah, like because you've you've chosen a career. I think it's very meaningful because you're you're yeah. working on something in 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 kind of a indirect way it's protecting humanity protecting <laughs> nature yeah so yeah i mean i'm a, i i like to define myself as a scientist and i look i like to study things in detail and understand how things work so i think that's that's my life i will keep doing it that it might be in in the private sector or in the public sector but that's what drives me right so I I will keep doing science and studying things, maybe using artificial intelligence or other techniques and uh, field field and computers and everything, all the tools that are available there to understand better how nature works and also how human work, because humans are also part of nature. Exactly. <laughs> and and what kind of advice would you give to somebody who's uh, younger and they're they're looking to to get in these kind of fields? Uh, I mean, I guess my, my advice is to to be curious and uh, be enthusiastic and follow follow the curiosity and see where it will bring you. Um, you know, might be volcanoes, might be landslides, might be computers. But the important thing is just to be, I guess, driven and do things that keep you engaged and and uh, and your brain active and happy. Right. Well, looking at your bio for the last 10 years, looks like you've had a, a busy time and it looks like very adventurous, kind of like an Indiana Jones life. But scientists uh, have kind of a bad image, I think, in the public's eye and in the media. But scientists are real people and dealing with real issues that affect all of us. Right. So, yeah. Wow. So here's my last question. Do you know anybody else do you think would be good at... Uh, they would be good to be a guest on this podcast. Uh, yeah, actually I do. I have a long list. It depends on on which hazard you want to assess first and uh, under which perspective. Okay, well, well, we're going to go through them one by one. But <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can see you probably met a lot of really interesting and uh, important experts in the last 10 years. So Wow, great. Well, I'll talk to you personally about that. But I really want to thank you for being here on this uh, Multi Hazards podcast. Yeah, I just yeah. wish you the best in uh, all that you're doing. It sounds fascinating. Thank you, and thanks for inviting and having me here and listen to my story. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. And all right, have an excellent weekend. Take care. Thank you. You too. Bye. So there's the interview. Dr. Roberti was a great guest, wasn't he? I want to thank him again for being our honored first interviewee. Here at the conclusion of this episode, I'd like to thank all of you, each one of you, for listening. Stay safe out there and stay tuned for more. This is Vin Nelson 
wishing you the best on your journey of surviving and thriving with all that life throws at you. Cheers to you all. Peace out.